Nerd Night Ann Arbor, Domestication of Cats. Hi, I'm Jessica. Hi, Jessica. So normally I'm a high school math teacher, uh, but the summer's here, so I'm not doing anything. And But I'm also a crazy cat lady, as obvious by my outfit. So um, I'm going to be giving you a crash course on our feline friends. And first I'd like to touch about, talk about the domestication. How are cats domesticated? And I also want to review what domestication is. So domestication is a genetic modification of the animals compared to the wild counterparts. And this was discovered by Charles Darwin. And this occurred around 10,000 BC when the humans started to convert from a hunter-gatherer society to a more agricultural-based society. And there are about five characteristics that make an animal perfect for domestication. I'm going to relate these five characteristics to cats. So we have number one. So um, cats, they can live solitary or they live in groups. We have number two where cats breed with a variety of different other cats and they also breed with wild cats. And we have number three where uh, kittens and mothers bond fairly quickly. At seven weeks old, they can be taken from their mother and then at seven months or six months old, they reach sexual maturity. And then we have four where um, cats eat a variety of different meats and then they have adapted to living almost anywhere on the planet. And then we have number five where they have been able to bond with humans and given time, they can adjust to new environments and external stimuli. If you've ever moved with your cats before, you know how frustrating it is. All right, so we have three different pathways for domestication. So cats are going to fall in the first category. They are developed for human niches, and this is also going to include dogs, mice, gerbils, whatever you consider to be a pet. And then we have number two, which are animals that we breed for eating. So we have cows, pigs, chickens. And then we have three, which are animals that we use for non-food resources like horses and sheep and oxen. Now, talking about cats specifically, so domesticated cats all originate from an ancestor, the North African Southwest Asian wildcat, and the domestication began in the Fertile Crescent and later in ancient Egypt. And if you don't know what the Fertile Crescent is, is what we consider to be the Middle East. So, with their increase in agriculture, this uh, brought the rodents to our settlements, and then the rodents attracted the wildcats. And over time, we formed a mutualistic relationship with the cats, and they became domesticated. And their uh, mice catching abilities became useful when on ships, so this is how cats also inhabited all parts of the world. So I want to touch a little bit on feral cats because they are of the domestic cat species, but they have been removed from human contact, so they generally avoid humans. So a cat that's born in the wild is going to become feral unless they become socialized with humans by eight weeks old. So there's not a lot of time to get them socialized with humans. Um, Any time after that, it's going to become increasingly difficult for them to be socialized. There are stories online, I'm sure you see them, about feral cats uh, being brought in the house and adjusting to human life, but this takes a very long time and a lot of patience. Um, so this is why I'm happy that I found my cat Cortez at six weeks old outside because I can't imagine a life without him and he's so attached to me I can't imagine him not being. So now here are some traits to look for if you come across a cat outside. Um, now these traits come from the um, Humane Society of Huron Valley's website. And you might be familiar with their trap, neuter, return program, which is the best way to control the feral cat colonies, where they're going to trap a cat, they bring it to the facility and spare or neuter it, and they're not adoptable. So they're not going to get adopted, so they just release it back into the colony. And since the colony no longer has reproductive ability, it's going to eventually die out. Okay, I was supposed to... so. I hope you are good on your breed knowledge because if you guess correctly in what breed this is, you're going to win a cat butt magnet. So, so, if the 
this breed here? Is this a American short hair, Egyptian Mao, Russian blue, or Manx? Okay, I need someone to raise their hand so they can get a bag. Now. Okay, you're right here. Yes, it is a Russian blue. Hey. So a Russian blue is best known for their blue tinted coat and their green eyes. And if you or someone in your family is allergic to cats, this would be the breed for you because their coat is hypoallergenic. All right, you ready for another question? Okay, get ready. So is this a Maine Coon, Persian, Himalayan, or Burmese? You right there. No. Yes, Maine Coon. So, come up and get your magnet. So, uh, Maine Coon, they are the largest domestic cat breed, weighing up to 25 pounds. And it might be seem obvious from their name, but they're the official state cat of Maine. <laughs> All right, there'll be four more chances for you to win a magnet, but now for more information. <laughs> so, now we have, we're going to move on to societies that have cats in their mythology or folklore. And you're probably most familiar with the Egyptians, and I am going to touch on that. However, there might be a society that um, you may not associate with cats, and that would be the Celtics. So the Celtics, if you don't know, that's Scotland area, and they worshipped a fairy creature called the Kachi. So that's the correct pronunciation, Kachi. And... Um, and this was inspired by a wild cat named the Kellis cat, which is all black, but it has a white patch of fur on its chest. Now, there are three events that they celebrated for the Kachi. The first one being Phile Fadalak, or late wake. So they believed that the Kachi would steal the souls of the dead before the gods could claim it. So they would have this person watch the body from death to burial, and doing all sorts of these distractions to make sure that the Kachi would not steal the soul of their beloved. <laughs> so now we have the Samhain, uh, which is we know in America as Halloween. And you would leave a tree out for the Kachi, and if you left a tree out, it would bless you. And then if you did not leave a tree, it would curse your cows. And then uh, lastly, the most gruesome of these three practices is the tog ham, and that involved burning the bodies of cats um, for the kachi, or otherwise known as big ears, and all participants would be granted a wish. So, um, yeah, but let's move on to the Egyptians. Uh, and since cats originated in Egypt, it kind of makes sense that they began to worship them. And so the first feline goddess that we're going to go over is Skemet. And Skemet comes from an Egyptian word called Skemet. Skemet and, or Skaham, sorry, Skaham. And that means power or might. Um, you can see in the bottom here, I have the lineage of Skemet. And this depends on the region of Egypt that you are in. So it's interchangeable with Bastet, which I'm also going to be talking about. Um, and Skemet had a temple, so when the Greeks came and explored this area, they were uh, very surprised that they actually had live lions in her temple. The next two deities are Mahes and Mafdet. So Mahes means he who is true beside her. He also had a temple which was right adjacent to Skemet's. And then we have Mafdet, which is the first of many cat deities. Now, the most popular deity was probably Bastet. Uh, Bastet started as a fierce warrior and then over time became associated with protecting the king and protecting the home. It was also known as being the goddess of fertility. Uh, again, depending on the region of Egypt you're in, the lineage changes. 
And if you've been to the DIA, they have a statue of Baystead there. And this is actually the picture of that statue. And then they also have a head bust statue of Skemet there as well. Now here's the city of Bubasis where uh, Baystead's temple was held. And every year they will hold festivals there. And you can akin these festivals being a lot like Mardi Gras and Carnival where people just get freaking crazy. And, uh, <laughs> But yeah, and later when they came and uh, discovered this temple, there were 300,000 mummified cats there. So when people's cats died, they would bring their cat here to be mummified because um, they did see it as protector of the home and they wanted them to live in the afterlife. And there's also been other mummified cats found at Beni Hassan and Sakura locations. Okay. You ready for more trivia questions? Yeah. Okay. So this picture here, it says a Bombay, Siamese, Ragdoll, or Burmese? Uh, plaid shirt guy. Siamese, yes. So Siamese cats. If you plan on um, having one of these, you want to make sure you're around a lot. Or if you're going to be gone for long periods of time, you might want to get a friend. They've been known to get depression if they're alone for too long a time. And then uh, they're very chatty, and they originate from Siam, which is present-day Thailand. All right, another chance to get a magnet. Okay, is this a Savannah, Bengal, Cornus Rex, or Oxycat? Uh, Emily. No. Uh, you over there? No. Uh, uh, stitch shirt. Yes, yeah, Savannah. So the Savannah is a hybrid between a serval and a domestic cat. The first cross occurred in 1986, and the kitten was named Savannah. Uh, so be prepared if you have one of these. They are, have lots of energy, and they're very high jumpers, and most of them love to play in water. Okay, there's two more chances to win a magnet. So, All right, so the last portion of my presentation is going to relate to uh, some anatomy things about cats. Um, I'll be touching on just a few characteristics that I feel are unique to cats. So first we have their skeleton. They have 245 bones. We humans only have 205. Um, now they have, of those bones, seven of them are the lumbar vertebrae bones. We humans have five. And those two extra bones are what give the cats the ability to uh, make sure they land on their feet when they fall. And this is called the rightening reflex. Uh, the series of midair twists that the cat will do so that they land on their feet before they land on the ground. Uh, next. <laughs> Has your cat ever made this face? Okay. Well, there's a name for that, and it's called the Fleming response. And when a cat uh, wants to get a better smell of something, they're going to open their mouth like that, and this allows the smell to go into their jake. Jacobson organ, which helps process the smell better. And they normally make that face when they smell like another animal or something. Um, now, the Fleming response, that's a very unique feature to cats and ugulets. And ugulets are the hooved animals like pigs and cattle and horses. All right, purring, what I've considered my favorite characteristic. And... <laughs> Uh, it is so nice to come home from work and have my cat Zelda um, on my lap purring, and it makes me feel very relaxed. And there's actually a scientific reason for this. Um, there's been studies to show that the cat purring on your lap can help lower your blood pressure. Okay, toe beans. So. Those soft pads are strong enough to go on rough terrain, but yet they're sensitive to temperature and any vibrations they feel in the ground. And if you ever wondered why your cat has ninja-like skills, and it's because they walk on their tippy toes. 
Um, and this is called digit grade. And this helps them silently um, stalk their prey. Uh, now, the front paws, they normally have four toe beans and their dew claw, and then the back paws have four toe beans. However, there is a genetic mutation called polydactyl, where the front paws are going to have more than four toe beans. Um, now, having these extra toe beans doesn't necessarily hurt the cat. However, they tend to grow a claw, like, in between their paws. So you got to make sure that you cut that so it doesn't become ingrown. So this is my roommate's cat, Arabella, or otherwise known as Bella Beans. And she is polydactyl. So one of her paws has six toe beans, the other one has seven. <laughs> so uh, whiskers. Um, so whiskers are not hair. There are some practices where people cut their whiskers, and you should not do that. So um, now the whiskers are touch receptors that feel for vibrations in the air, and it help, also helps the cat know if they can fit in a space. They're also an indicator of mood. So if, you, if the whiskers are pulled back against their face, it means that they're scared. If they're pulled forward, it means that they're ready to attack or they're hunting. And if the whiskers are just in their normal position, the cat's calm and doing whatever. Now, uh, Whiskers, they are shed and they grow new ones. And I find the discarded whiskers around my house sometimes and it gives me a chance to feel how thick they are. They kind of feel like, they feel like plastic. Like that's how thick they are. And then lastly, we have their sandpaper tongues. So the cat of a tongue has backward facing barbs on it called papillae. And these barbs help rafts the meat off of their bones of their prey. So I know it's easy to forget, but your cat is a born killer. And they also know how to eat their prey. So, and then these barbs also help uh, clean any loose dirt and debris or, or hair off of the cat when they groom. Now there's three reasons that three reasons why the cat will groom. One is survival. So <laughs> Okay, so if they just eat in their prey, they're going to lick themselves of any smells that their prey might have put on their body. And this is so other prey and other predators will not smell them. And the next is comfort. They use it as a way of cooling themselves off through evaporation. And then lastly, it's a behavior thing. If they're stressed or anxious, they're going to lick themselves. And sometimes they get a bald spot from over-grooming. Uh, and it's also a social thing. So if you have multiple cats in your home, you probably see them licking each other a lot. And this is called aloe grooming. And this is so that all the cats in the same group keep the same scent on them. My cats do that all the time. It's kind of gross. <laughs> All right, two more chances to win a cat bug magnet. So, is this an American Shorthair, a Minx, Berman, or Oxy Cat? Uh, over there? Yes, a Minx. So, the Minx is known for its short bob-like tail. This was a mutation that occurred on the Isle of Man, which is a little island between Great Britain and Ireland. All right, the last magnet. So, what is this? Abyssinian, munchkin, sphinx, or oriental short hair? Okay, over there in the black shirt, I think. Okay. Yes, the sphinx. Okay, um, so the Sphinx is known, known for being hairless. Again, this is another breed you might want to get if you're allergic to cats. Um, it was bred, selectively bred in the 1960s. If you own one of these, please be prepared to bathe them a lot because the body oils will build up on their skin. Normally, these body oils are absorbed by their fur, but since they don't have any, you're going to have to wash them off. Thank you for coming to my first Nerd Night presentation. This program was recorded on June 20th, 2019 
at live.